Tony's aunt, uh, Susan's sister-in-law, Tony Colella and Susan uh, Colella. Uh, that would be their aunt and sister-in-law. She is, she is in the last stages of, of cancer right now, and their family is going through a great deal. She is born again, and uh, but it's not easy for the family, and it's not easy for her to leave her family. So please be in prayer for them as a family. If you've been through that sort of thing, I think you could understand that they need God's grace. If you haven't been through that sort of thing, uh, you will someday. It's one of those things where we as brothers and sisters in Christ need to bear one another's burdens. And we're, Bella, are you going to go to the kids? Okay. I have to tell Miss to call my dad. Not right now. We're in church, so why don't you go back to the kids' church, okay? <laughs> we have a lost child. <laughs> that you'll behave yourselves. You might, you might get lucky here. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5, and we'll get into the text of the Scripture today. The Bible says in verse 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. In verse 2, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, We'll stop there, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. I believe we're going to be greatly helped by the scripture this morning. Father, we pray for help this morning. Lord, so many times we miss what the scripture is teaching because of preconceived notions. So we ask for help with that. Sometimes sometimes we're not honest in our hearts. We even deceive ourselves when we think that we're being honest when we study your word. So help us this morning to honestly open the word and honestly inquire of you whether the things that your word says are what we believe. And if they are, and Father, help us to practice them. If they're not what we believe, God, then help us to straighten out our belief and then practice, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is the most famous sermon in the Bible, only it really uh, is not a gospel sermon. It really is teaching. And I've asked people before, what's the greatest message which was ever preached in the Scripture? What was the greatest message ever preached in the Scripture? And most people will say the Sermon on the Mount. This is when Jesus was what we call the Sermon on the Mount. People say that. I actually personally disagree with that. I'm not uh, particularly concerned that you uh, hold with my persuasion, but I will tell you that preaching always is the Gospel. Preaching is the Gospel. When I preach... I declare the good news. The word et caruso literally means I preach the gospel. So if it's preaching, and if that if the sermon is preaching, uh, then it has to be the gospel. And I will just tell you at the outset that there isn't a trace of the gospel in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Now Jesus is the gospel. We could apply it and say Jesus Christ is the gospel. But this is not Jesus explaining to people how to be born again. Jesus is not here saying this is the gospel. Jesus gave the gospel to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and it was an entirely different message than Matthew 5, Matthew 6. Okay, so I will say to you that in my opinion, which I will not compare with the opinions of those who would say that this is the greatest sermon ever preached. This could be the greatest teaching there ever was, but I will not call it a sermon. People would say this is the greatest sermon ever preached. I would say the greatest sermon ever preached is when the Holy Spirit preached a message in Acts on the day of Pentecost through the disciples, including Peter. And the very people who crucified Jesus said, Men and brethren, what must we do? <laughs> Men and brethren, they were pricked to their hearts, their Bible said, and they repented. And they, that same day, uh, there were thousands literally baptized and added to the church. And I think the most powerful sermons in the Bible are actually in the Acts of the Scripture. So, if you're talking about teaching, this is the greatest teaching in the Bible. It is as great as any teaching in the Bible. There's not a greater teacher than Jesus. Are we in agreement on this? Yeah. 
But if you're talking about preaching the gospel, this is not the gospel. Pastor, why do you spend so much time on it? Because many evangelical believers teach the gospel from Matthew chapter 5 and 6, and it's incredibly confusing. Matter of fact, if you were to look at the Sermon on the Mount, if we call it that, you would see that Jesus, or you would come away believing that Jesus teaches at works based salvation. In other words, you have to be poor in spirit. You have to be, you have to be, you have to be. You have to do these things in order to be saved. And here, Jesus is not telling his disciples how to be saved. Let's dial back just, just a tad, if we will, please. Will you? Let's think about this. We have discussed it in the last several weeks. But the fact of the matter is that discipleship and salvation aren't the same. Can one be a disciple and not be saved? Yes. Yeah, give me an example. <laughs> Judas. Judas. Was Judas not a disciple? He was. he was a disciple. Was Judas saved? No. He was not saved. Okay, Jesus is speaking here, the Bible says, to His disciples. And He's teaching them the qualifications for a disciple. He's teaching them how to be disciples. And one of those here taught is Judas. In the previous chapter, in chapter 4, you'll see how Jesus called some of His disciples. He saw Simon, He saw, uh, saw Peter and his brother. And He said, follow me. They were fishing, remember? And He said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they left their nets, and they followed Him. They became disciples when they followed Jesus. But discipleship is not the same as salvation. I don't like to give too many, too many specifics because I don't like to give too much credit to the wrong people or make it as though what people says has too much credibility. I'll be quite frank with you. You shouldn't think too much about what I say any more than I should think too much about what anyone else says. We need to think a lot about what God says and insofar as a person preaches the Word of God, then think a great deal of the preaching of the Word of God. But if a person has preached the truth... It's not His truth. Whereas I don't have teaching. bothers me when people say, well, I don't agree with your position on that. Because I think, is that what I've conveyed? Is that what I have made people think? Is that this is what I teach? This is what I believe? I just told you a minute ago, I believe that the greatest message ever preached was on the day of Pentecost. That's what I believe. There's a big difference between me preaching that for fact. You could argue other gospel sermons are greater or were greater used, and I'd be okay with that. That's my opinion. But I will tell you that there's a difference between the gospel and between discipleship, and that's not my opinion. That's the teaching of the Scripture. And so you didn't find that truth at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church when you get it. You found it in the Scripture. And I may be the instrument that God uses to preach it, but I'm not the source of the truth. And neither is anyone else. And so I'm careful sometimes not to give too much credence or credibility to a person who preaches error. But a good example of a bad example in this context would be the book John MacArthur wrote, The Gospel According to Jesus. And it was terrible in its first edition. He corrected some things in the second edition and made it worse. And then by the time the third edition happened, uh, John MacArthur teaches and preaches a works-based salvation. And uh, he teaches, the title of his book is The Gospel According to Jesus. And guess where the gospel according to Jesus in his book comes from? First of all, it comes from John MacArthur. It doesn't come from Matthew 5 and 6. It comes from John MacArthur. And he teaches discipleship as the gospel. And I'll just tell you, friend, a lot of what he says is proper application of the Scripture for a disciple. But never in his book is anything properly applied. Now, they use the never statement. You could say, well, pastor, you know, he was right about this word. Yeah, I mean, if you disassemble his words, his words were all correct, as long as you don't put them into his sentences. I'm being overly <laughs> sarcastic here today. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that what he teaches the gospel is, is what Jesus says is discipleship, and they're different. And if I can help you today with some simple thinking, you'll be more intelligent than John MacArthur. Not that... Uh, you know, your intelligence means anything, but you'll be at least better educated or better able to apply the Scripture, and you won't harm so many people's faith in Jesus. Right. A great deal of people have been seriously 
harmed by making salvation or the gospel a works matter rather than a gift and a faith matter. Salvation, my friend, according to Jesus, not according to John MacArthur. And I, I think in some of my copies of the gospel according to Jesus that I have in my library, I've crossed out according to Jesus and put according to John MacArthur on the book. Just so in case I die and somebody gets my books, they'll know Pastor Price is not endorsing this gospel according to Jesus. It's the gospel according to John MacArthur. I'm, I'm a sarcastic individual, and sometimes I'm a little mean about it. And I don't mean to be mean. I'm just having fun this morning, and I hope that this is the right crowd to do that with. And if you don't like it, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I sincerely apologize. I'm not trying to be offensive this morning. I'm just simply trying to strongly state a fact, so much so that you get the point of what I'm saying. And sometimes overstatement is a help, and so I'm overstating things, perhaps just a little bit, uh, because I don't hate John MacArthur. I just... Uh, hate his, his doctrine, his gospel, and it's, it's just damaged. It's, in, it's in fe affected so many people. Uh, let me just put it this way. Last week, three different people I spent a good deal of my week with helping them get assurance of their salvation because John MacArthur stole it from them. And that's pretty normal. I spent a lot of time almost every week with people calling me and asking me about the gospel and asking me, I, don't, I just think I failed God. I don't think I can be saved because I'm not good enough because of John MacArthur's gospel and the folks that he's influenced. And so it's pervasive and it's damaging. And so we're going to preach the Bible now and uh, we'll get away from all of that. But do you understand that this passage of Scripture, Jesus is teaching His disciples. He's not teaching unsaved people. He's not teaching people who do not know Him. He's not explaining here in this passage how to be born again, how to have eternal life. He's explaining how to be a disciple. Now let's get practical. There are prerequisites for discipleship, but I will say one of the things, if I were creating a discipleship manual, which is literally what Jesus is doing here, if I were creating a discipleship manual and I were to write in the prerequisites or in the, you know, the qualifications for the course, you know, if you take a class, like a lot of times there's prerequisites to take. If you're in college, if you take any 201 classes, you have to have the 101 class first, or take the 102, you have to take the 101, they're prerequisites things you have to have done beforehand. I would say, if I were writing a discipleship manual, that a prerequisite for discipleship is salvation. And you'd all nod your heads and agree with me, and every one of us would be disagreeing with Jesus. Because actually, he had Judas for a disciple. So either, you know, help Jesus, or just take the teaching, and don't make it the gospel. Did you get that? Does that make sense to everybody? In other words, if I were writing prerequisites, this is required in order to be a disciple, I would say you have to be born again. But Judas was a disciple, and he was not born again. And Jesus knew that. So let's don't add to the Scripture then. Let's don't put prerequisites into the Scripture. Will it do you any good to be a disciple of Jesus if you're not saved? No. No more good than it did Judas. But here's an important nugget for you. There quite possibly are disciples who are not believers. There quite possibly are disciples who are not believers. I have in my lifetime dealt with people that the Holy Spirit just kind of finally said, ask the question, when were you born again to? Because they were disciples. Sometimes they're Judas-like. You want to talk about Judas as a disciple, Judas would have been the most careful, the most conscientious, the most knowledgeable about discipleship. And Judas always had great suggestions. If you read the things that Judas said, he was pretty dead on with his understanding of discipleship. He was a pretty good disciple. He's the guy, you remember, who kept the bag. Out of the twelve, why would it be that Judas was the one entrusted to keep the money? Well, the Bible says he was a thief. That was the motive of his heart. But why would the rest of the guys want Judas to keep the money? They trusted him. He was careful with it. He's the guy that said when the alabaster box was broken and Jesus was anointed with it, he said, why was not this sold and the money used to feed the poor? And the Bible says, this he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and kept the bag. 
In other words, he sounded right, actually. Why don't we feed the poor? Why such wanton waste of valuable things? And every one of you guys would be like, yeah, Judas. All of us would, wouldn't we? Yeah, Judas, you're right. You know, we shouldn't waste things. We should give to the poor. But the motive of his heart was not because he loved Jesus. It wasn't the motive that the woman had because she was preparing for his burial and she believed in Jesus. The motive of his heart was, if it were really sold, I'd give some money to the poor and then some of it would go trickle out of the bag and into my pocket. And he was a disciple. Okay, Christian. You can't be a good disciple. Could we agree on this? You can't be a good disciple and not be saved. Yeah, right. So Judas was a disciple. Well, we'd agree he wasn't a good disciple. Is that? Could can we, can we leave it at that? All right. Do we understand, though, when it comes to prerequisites for discipleship, that you and I don't really have permission to create qualifications or prerequisites? In other words, if I'm writing a sermon on discipleship or writing a manual on discipleship, and I'm just thinking it through, I'm going to say, you've got to be saved to be a disciple. And you would probably just say, yeah, pastor, you're right. Except Judas wasn't. And so, I'm actually not right. You see sometimes how the way that we think isn't always the way God thinks. Sometimes the way that we reason isn't God's thinking. And in a situation where the way I think isn't the same as what Jesus thinks, who's always right? Jesus is. But I'll be honest with you, if I'm one of the twelve, I'm going to have a meeting with Jesus. Hey, Jesus, there's a little something I'd like to bring to your attention here. We really probably ought to make prerequisites for being a disciple, don't you think? Right? I don't you think, you know, at least I ought to you know, suggest, do you think Jesus knows that? Do you think Jesus has an understanding? Does, I mean, does Jesus know more about discipleship than I do? Yeah. You know what Jesus' answer for me would be? He'd say, Ryan, the way I think is not the way you think. And I'd be like, uh huh? And he'd say, and that's true about just about everything. And knowing that Jesus is God, I just have to say, well, then I better figure out how you think versus how I think about a lot of things because I've got to rechange, I've got to reinvent or redevelop my thinking. And friend, this passage of Scripture is all about. God thinks this way. People think this way. You're God's child and you want to be right. Better redevelop your thinking. There is a lot of room for development in our thinking. I'm amazed at how we think that by dialogue or reason we can bring people to our point of view when actually what has to happen is that hearts have to be changed. <laughs> I'm a conservative politically. Just tell you straight up. I don't care. I'm not talking politics right now. I'm just telling you what I am personally. I'm a conservative politically. And I'll tell you why I'm a conservative politically. Because I'm a conservative as a Christian. And I'll be honest with you, I have very little in common with lost conservatives. I probably have more in common with lost liberals than I do with lost conservatives. It's, it's just the application of it. And as such, I'm not really able to persuade people. In other words, I like, I like dialogue. I like, you could call it argument if you like. I like to challenge people's thinking, and I like to have my thinking challenged. I just like it. I, I think if you disagree with somebody, it's a great opportunity to figure out where they're coming from and if you might be wrong. And if they're fair, it's a great great opportunity for them to figure out where you're coming from and if they might be wrong. If two people believe opposite things, someone's right, someone's wrong. And I'll be the first to admit there's room for improvement here, and I had rather be right than wrong. So as a Christian, we ought to be willing to be challenged, and we ought to be willing to challenge. And when people are unwilling to be challenged, you ought to challenge their unwillingness to be challenged. What are you afraid of? Why can't your thinking be challenged? What are, you, what are you hiding? What are you hiding from? 
But I don't think I've ever persuaded anybody about anything politically. Even though I'm pretty well persuaded politically. But I have seen people change their politics when they change what they believe about God and His Word. How many of us that would be true for? If I weren't saved, I'd be different politically. Look at the people raising their hand. Yeah, it's, like, it's true. I'd be totally different if I weren't saved. My politics would be different if I were lost. It's just true. Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm not here preaching how to change people's politics. That's not the point of this <laughs> message. But I'm just telling you, when you think like God does, it changes how you think. There are so many things that on a functional daily basis I do in a different way than I would if I didn't if I were not a disciple of Jesus. I handle on a daily basis so many things differently than I would if I were not a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Because I've realized man's way, man's thinking is wrong, God's way, God's thinking is right. Let's look at some instances of this and the truth of it. Look down with me in verse 3. This is what Jesus taught the people. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now I will say that the truths in this passage of Scripture are paradoxical. They're paradoxical. Paradox means an apparent, like a contradiction. You and I think that the best thing for anybody and and best thing for anybody's spirit is to be rich or to be abounding or abundant. And in context, are those not terms that have to do with God's plan for us? Does the Bible ever indicate that for a believer there is such thing as fullness of joy? Does the Bible ever indicate that for believers there's a such thing as wealth? and physical blessing. Yeah, actually, that's not the Gospel, but there are indications of that. In Sunday school this morning, we quoted Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. For then shalt thou observe to, or to do according to all that's written therein, and then shalt thou make thy way prosperous and have good success. So if God's Word doesn't depart out of your mouth, you'll have prosperity and success. You say, Pastor, let's just... You know, it's emotional prosperity. It's not physical prosperity. In that context, Joshua was speaking on behalf of God to the nation of Israel about their crops, about their land, about going into the land and inhabiting and inheriting an inheritance in it. And he said, if you do things this way, you'll be prosperous and have good success. Okay, so when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, is he saying a person should never have joy or never have a spiritual blessing? No. But there are paradoxical truths here. Because the reality of it is, is that a person who is rich in spirit will never see himself as having need. A person who's just fine, I'm talking about the spiritual well-being of a person, a person who's just fine doesn't need anything. And the Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We saw, didn't we not, the contrast between Lazarus and the rich man? You know the contrast between Lazarus and the rich man, don't you? The contrast is, is that the rich man didn't see any need. He had this world's goods. Didn't need anything from Jesus. Didn't need anything from God. Lazarus was begging for the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. When the rich man died, he went to hell... When the poor man died, he went to heaven. Or went to paradise, I should say. In that case, who was most blessed? Read Luke 16 sometime and you'll understand what it means to be poor in spirit. Here's a guy who sees himself as holy, needy. Holy as in W-H-O-L-L-Y. Completely needy. And because he was needy, he saw that he needed God. And he needed Jesus and the consequence of that is he woke up in paradise. The rich man saw himself as needing nothing. And he woke up in hell because he never saw his need. Who's more blessed, the poor in spirit or the rich in spirit? The poor in spirit. And so here I have to say, I wouldn't have thought of that, but guess who's right? I wouldn't have thought of that, would you? 
I think it's a bad thing to be needy. To see yourself as, you know, I, I can't even take care of myself. I need to eat crumbs from the rich man's table. He's covered in sores. He has health needs. He has physical needs. He has financial needs. And I think it's bad, but his spirit is crushed as a result of it. And in the crushing of his spirit came a need or an understanding of his need. And in his understanding of his need, the poor man received Jesus. At men's retreat this last week, one of the men preached about, he preached about when Jesus said that uh, or that it's easier for a rich man or for a camel to go through an eye of a needle uh, but than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then later on when his disciples asked him about it, Jesus said with uh, men, these things are impossible. With God, all things are possible. So Jesus is not anywhere teaching a rich man can't get saved. He's just saying it's a miracle. And I, I like what Dr. Bill said. I think it was Dr. Bill that, that used the illustration or preached it. He said, is it a miracle, is it a miracle when a poor man gets saved? Is it a miracle when a sinner gets saved? Is it a miracle when a good person gets saved? It's a miracle. And so with God, all things are possible. So can God save rich people? Yeah, He sure does. Just like He saves poor people. Jesus' point in that passage of Scripture was not rich people don't go to heaven. Jesus' point was it's impossible and only God can save them. Only God can do it. Thank God that He's able to save to the uttermost all them that call upon Him. And God can show a rich man his need, can't He? Aren't you thankful for the circumstances in your life that God allowed to help you to see your need? Yes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Is Jesus right about that? Man, is He right. See, I'd say, no, 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 no. And Jesus would say, yes, blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'd say, okay, yeah, okay. All right. You're right. <laughs> right? I'm just telling you, thinking like a disciple is not thinking the way we naturally think. And Jesus is teaching how to think if you're a disciple. Then He said, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Oh, great. Mourning. For the sake of comfort? And if you ask me on the surface... Is it worth it to go through grief just to be comforted? <laughs> Is it? Well, ask, a, ask an infant sometime. Ask an infant sometime. They won't answer you, but think about it, will you? Sometimes, tell me why babies cry. On a basic level, they cry because they can't talk and it's their form of communication, right? Right? Am I wrong about that? It really looks like, no, uh -uh, that's not why babies cry. Babies cry because that's how they communicate. And they don't usually communicate happy thoughts. You know, when they're happy, they just go. And when they're upset, then they, ah, 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 ah. you know, they do that thing with baby voices. Okay? Babies cry because they're communicating. What do babies communicate? I'm hungry. I'm bloated. <laughs> Uh, I'm messy. Um, and then sometimes babies cry and you check them and their belly's not bloated and their diaper's not dirty and uh, they won't eat. What do they want? They want to be comforted. They just want to be held. They just want to be loved. They just want attention. <laughs> and you know, a great source of depression and loneliness is the need for comfort. Right actually. You know, sometimes people do the craziest things. And on a surface level, I'm like, what are you doing? You ever, you ever seen somebody doing something? You're like, that is the dumbest thing ever. Why are you doing that? People have self-destructive behavior. I mean, self-destructive behavior. And you ask, why is the person being self-destructive? Why are they harming themselves? What's the answer? They want to be comforted. They actually want attention, and the attention is comforting to them. Uh, there is just something about when you're going through a hard time and somebody comes and puts their arm around you. It just comforts you. You're going to make it. I love you. Jesus cares. I care. 
person who never mourns is never comforted. And all of us have a need, a spiritual need of comfort, don't we? Who knows that better than anybody? The person who made everybody. God does. Comfort is a basic human need. And Jesus said to His disciples, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, on the surface, if Jesus were to say, Ryan Price, mourning's a good thing, I'd say, not so, Lord. <laughs> not for me, it's not. I don't need to be comforted. I don't need to mourn. No, we all do. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. See, we think a person who doesn't have need and a person who's okay has it made, don't we? And actually, the Scripture is teaching the entire opposite truth. All right, verse, uh, the third thing. Verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We had men's retreat. We had this one covered too. This is interesting. Uh, Brother Frank Finney preached about Moses, the meekest man that ever lived, the meekest man on the earth, about a man Moses. And I've heard meekness described or defined many ways. One of the ways that I've heard meekness defined is strength under control. Strength under control. And I will say that Moses did personify that, didn't he? Moses was never weak. A weak man doesn't lead two and a half million people. You, you wouldn't call Moses weak. Matter of fact, a weak man, uh, a, a weak man just couldn't survive the way Moses survived. Moses was a strong man, but the Bible says he was a meek man, and he was meek in the way he handled things. Most of the time, before the people that followed Moses rejected God, they rejected him. Most of the time, before the people that rejected God, uh, rejected that followed Moses rejected God, they rejected him. And Moses' response usually, except for one time in his life, Moses' response was to go to God on their behalf and ask for God's mercy. Remember when God said, Moses, stand aside, I'll kill these people. I'm done with them. You stand aside and I'll kill them and I'll make a, I'll make a nation out of you. That would appeal to a man's pride, to be quite frank. I mean, instead of Abraham, it's going to be Moses. That would appeal to a man's pride, wouldn't it? And Moses begged God for His mercy on the behalf of the people. Moses was a meek man. He set aside himself, his own motives. And the Bible says, blessed are the meek. Our thinking, our philosophy would be, meek is weak. And weak people never win. It's true in business, isn't it? The way we think. We think it's true. But it's actually not. There are many meek people who personify meekness the way God teaches it, and they're not weak. Very successful. You know, a meek man, I think, or a man, I have to be careful because I'm not God, but a man, I think, in our generation, or he just passed away a few years ago, that just personified meekness was Truett Cathy. I don't know if you ever got to hear Truett Cathy speak in person. How many of y'all ever heard Truett Cathy speak in person? Okay, so several of you guys have. Wasn't it interesting to hear him speak that how... Just kind of humble he was. Mm -hmm. Just a really humble man. You know who Truett Cathy was, right? Mm -hmm. you know, he found a Chick-fil-A restaurants. Mm -hmm. In fast food. <laughs> There's no way. It's just, it's just chicken sandwiches. Okay. Just chicken sandwiches. Polynesian sauce. What? Polynesian sauce. And just Polynesian sauce. Whatever that is. But he found a Chick-fil-A restaurants. And he honestly, Chick-fil-A is the most successful fast food chain. It's a cut above other fast food. I don't care particularly for Chick-fil-A. I'm not endorsing them today. I don't think their chicken sandwiches are really a sandwich. I've never met a chicken as small as the chicken that produced the small chicken breast. So I think just like White Castle and Crystal use horse meat, I think they're using like pigeons or something for chicken sandwiches. So I'm, I'm just not crazy impressed with Chick-fil-A. But true, Kathy is wildly successful. Serious, I've got packs of chicken breasts in my refrigerator, and they're this big. Truett Cathy's breast, whole breast, is like, you know, like that. I don't know what he did to the chickens. The baby chickens? I don't know. Yours is full of hormones. Yeah. Oh. You can't taste that? But I've raised chickens and never found a chicken breast that small. I've shot wild prairie chickens in the pasture that have never been injected with anything, and they've never been interbred with anything. 
and they're bigger than that. So I don't know. I don't, it's just hard. I've, I've eaten quail. They're bigger than that. Doves are bigger than that. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to step on your feelings, Chick fil A lovers. <laughs> My illustration was not about Chick fil A. My illustration was about Truett Cathy. Truett Cathy uh, is a very meek kind of a person. People said, you can't, you can't close a business on Sunday and be successful. And he said, well, I can't open on Sunday and please God. Can't do it. And you know something? Every time I want to go to Chick-fil-A, it's closed. But <laughs> so I always start thinking about taking Anthony there tonight, tonight to celebrate his 18th birthday, but nope. True Kathy, I think, was a meek man. He was just a... Man, the man was attacked for a lot of things, for supporting family, God's way, and so forth. Never spoke out, never said anything against people, just did right. Just a good man, just a godly man. That's meekness. And he's pretty successful, I would have to say, wouldn't you? Yeah, he's in heaven. <laughs> that's pretty good. That's you know that's that's a pretty good ending. So now moving forward, that I need to write that in my Bible. Use the illustration of Truett Cathy for meekness. Not really Moses is a biblical illustration. All right, and let's move on. Verse six: Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger is not enjoyable. Thirst is not enjoyable. But when you hunger and you and you're fed, you're satisfied. And when you thirst and you get drank, you're satisfied. And there are a bunch of unsatisfied people in this world who have never been hungry or never been thirsty. But the people that hunger and thirst after righteousness, my friend, have never not been filled. When God creates a spiritual famine in your life, it's one of the best things He can ever do. I've had it in the life of myself. I've experienced it as a believer. God, I just feel starved. God, I just feel I just feel dehydrated. I just feel thirsty. I'm just depleted. And oh, was that ever a good realization? Because then God says, "Okay, here you go. Here's food. Here's drink. They shall be filled." A person who never has hunger, a person who never has thirst, is never actually full. Hunger is a sensation. Thirst is a sensation, and they are both diagnostic of a reality that you are devoid of filling. And a person who never experiences those sensations is never filled. It's good, isn't it? Jesus is right, isn't He? He knows what He's talking about, doesn't He? And it isn't the way we think until we look at what Jesus says and then we realize, okay, here's why it's good to be hungry and thirsty. Here's why it's good to be poor. Here's why it's good to mourn. Here's why it's good to be meek. You're right, Jesus. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Oh, God, help me to be merciful. I don't, you don't have to explain it too well to me because I've needed mercy enough. I've needed mercy enough. I was counseling with somebody in another country this last week, and they said, I really appreciate that you don't treat me like I'm a horrible person because I'm working through problems. I told him, I said, well, the, the, the deal is, is that I'm worse than you. And if I treated you like you're a horrible person because you're working through problems, how would I be treated? I need mercy. And Jesus is right about that, isn't He? I don't think we need much explanation, do we? A merciful person obtains mercy, better merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Do you ever wonder why somebody has such a distorted view of God? How could someone see God as evil? You ever ask that question? How could a person literally with their eye, with their, their mind's eye, see God as evil? Want to answer it? Because people think that God likes the hunger of like Africa and Mm -hmm. All the bad stuff around the world happened. Okay, that's a that would be the argument. argument that they express for why God's evil. But why do they think that? Is that true? Is it true? What what is God doing with the poor in Africa? You know, there are a lot more Africans going to heaven. A lot more Africans coming to Jesus. 
than Americans, folks. Aren't there? I can preach the gospel in a poor country and have scores of people come to Jesus because they're hungry. What's God doing with the poor in Africa? You know what? If you purify your heart, you'll actually see God, what God's doing and you'll see what's important versus, versus what isn't. In other words, are they right about that? There are poor people in this world and say, if God is good, He can't be good because He's made these people poor. My friend, if God made them poor, it's so that they can be the hungry who are filled. If He made them poor, then it's so that they can, be, it's so that they can have the kingdom of heaven. It's so that they can be saved. Isn't that wonderful? Pure in heart. Pure in heart. Not looking at God with a distorted vision, but looking at God as He is. And when you see what God's actually doing, things don't seem so cruel, do they? I, I, I know some guys that train dogs, and uh, particular guys that train guard dogs, dogs that are actually defenders of their property. And I don't care if you agree with that or disagree with it. Dogs that are naturally protective and they have natural abilities or certain dogs are just fantastic for protection and there's a need for that and guys that train protective dogs dogs for protection one of the things that they'll do early on in the training is teach the dogs never to receive food from anybody but them so the dog won't get poisoned now what's a good way to trick a dog well just give it something it likes to eat and put poison and it'll kill him and then you don't have to worry about the dog right so what what will somebody else do? Well, they use it to compromise the dog. If he keeps eating food from him, they'll become friends, and then the dog won't guard the property or whatever, and it'll endanger. So one of the things they do is teach a dog never to receive food from anybody but them. So what they'll do sometimes is they'll use pepper or something really spicy, and they'll put it in the food, and they'll give it, they'll leave it, have a stranger feed it to the dog. Dog eats it, and whoa, <laughs> not good. And they'll do things like that where the dog realizes, I better never eat food from anybody but him. Can't trust anybody but th that person or these people. Well, is that cruel to teach a dog not to trust people? Wouldn't be cruel if somebody tried to poison him and it didn't work. Would it? Sometimes we don't realize or we don't know what God's doing. And when it seems that what God is doing is cruel, but actually God is preparing a person or protecting a person in the very thing that they'd be vulnerable to. I don't know how many circumstances in my life I have thought this is a mess. This this is just, I don't need this right now. And I found out later, yeah, that's exactly what I needed. Boy, did that ever turn out good. I don't know how many times things didn't work out the way I wanted them to work out, and then later on I thought, boy, I'm glad that didn't work out. Anybody else there? That's because God's good. Because God's merciful to you. Blessed are the verse 9, peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And uh, that's where we're going to end this week. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. person who knows God knows people that aren't God's people, right? It kind of bothers me that Christians feel the need to apologize for people like the Phelps. What's his name? Chuck? What's Chuck Fred Phelps? Phelps? Fred, what? Fred Phelps. That's the guy in, in uh, Topeka, Kansas, who hates people. It says God hates everybody. Um, you know something? Anybody that knows God knows that man's not a peacemaker. Trying to pick fights with everybody and everything. It's just for attention. and He's got his own motive, but he doesn't represent God. And you know something I can tell you definitively? He's not God's child, nor are his offspring. They're not God's children. Because the Bible says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I'm not saying God's children are always peaceable, but they're supposed to be. And God blesses it. When was the last time you prayed for peace? Is there ever a scriptural, biblical command for that? Pray for the peace at Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Uh, is there ever a place where God wants us to pray for peace? Every blessing that God promises toward His people or toward Israel is, is peace, isn't it? Remember what Paul said, pray for the authorities, the rulers that are over us, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life. Yeah, in all godliness. Peace is a quality of a disciple. So I started today by saying that these qualifications or these 
things don't make you a disciple. I started by saying you, that discipleship is not the same as salvation, and that salvation is not necessarily a prerequisite for a disciple. Now let me conclude by halfway contradicting myself. Will that be okay? Sure. Judas. Judas. Do you think that any of the blessings for do you think any of the blessings really helped Judas? I mean, you think Judas ever realized any of the blessings? That's how I mean to phrase it. You think Judas ever realized what it meant to be meek? Think he ever realized what it meant to be poor? Do you think he ever realized what it meant to mourn? I have to say that he was the worst disciple ever. And if you look at these instances and you look at his behavior, one of the things you'll conclude is that Judas never agreed with Jesus about discipleship. Even though he followed Jesus and pretended to be a disciple. And so I will say to you, my friend, again, as we conclude today, that though it is not listed as a prerequisite for discipleship, receiving the Gospel, receiving Jesus for your Savior, is the first and most important thing. So let me conclude by just reminding you of what the Gospel is. The Gospel is the good news about who Jesus is. Who Jesus is is that He is God's perfect Son. He never sinned. But we have sinned, haven't we? The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the Gospel is the good news that in spite of the fact that we sin, and the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Gospel is that Jesus died for our sin according to Scriptures. That's the Gospel. That's the good news. Why did Jesus die for our sin? How did Jesus have the right to die for our sin? He died for our sin because we were sinners. He died for our sin... Uh, he had the right to die for our sin because He was God's perfect Son. He'd never sinned. And so He died in our place. And the Gospel simply is that the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus is a gift for you. It's a substitution. Just like in a, in a game, if you got injured, you could call in a substitute to come in and take your place. Say it's a basketball game and you're a center or you're a forward or you're a point guard or whatever you are. And you could call in a sub to come take your place in a very literal sense, you are a sinner and you deserved hell. And you are to stand before God and be judged in your sin. And Jesus stood in your place of judgment. He stood in for you. And He did that for everybody, but the person who receives the Gospel is a person that looks to Jesus and says, I want the free gift. It's a gift of eternal life. Eternal life is not achieved or attained through discipleship. The gift of eternal life is achieved or attained by asking God for it. God, I'm a sinner and I deserve judgment. But Jesus took my place and I want what Jesus did to apply for me. I want Jesus to be my Savior. It isn't those words, it's the heart to receive Jesus. And the Bible says about people that receive Jesus, as many as received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. And you may not yet be a disciple, but you could be a child of God. They're different. And then discipleship applies. But friend, discipleship doesn't really mean anything if you aren't a believer. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? And are you? if you know Jesus as your Savior, do you know what it means to be a disciple? Because it doesn't mean what you probably think. Father, I pray that you would increase and bless these truths in our hearts and our minds. And I ask that you would bless in the closing of our service today, we ask in Jesus' name. In just a moment, I'm going to have an invitation. I want to ask that everybody, for the sake of the invitation, would keep their head bowed and their eyes closed. But today, we'll do things a little differently. I'm not going to have a come forward or go back in the invitation. I will ask our pianist to play softly anyhow. And while she plays, I just want to ask a couple of practical questions. The first question would be this. You may be here today, and the matter of discipleship is one that's really confused you. You may have heard before that you may have heard before that some things are required in order to have eternal life. I just want to tell you something. The only thing that's required is you to look to Jesus to receive Him as your Savior. If you're here this morning and you never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you say, Pastor, I'm concerned. I don't know that I'm going to have it. Don't call me out. Don't embarrass me. But I want you to know that I that this is a matter of concern for me. 
uh, I don't know for sure that I've received Jesus as my Savior. You just, with no one looking around, just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, I don't know that Jesus is my Savior. And I want to make sure I know. Don't call me out. Don't embarrass me. I want to know that. Okay? Anybody? I ask a second question while the pianist continues to play. And that question would simply be this. Pastor, you know, sometimes I've been a little bit confused about what's required to be a disciple. Sometimes I've even questioned whether or not I'm God's child because I realize that I'm not a good disciple. But today, looking at what Jesus says about discipleship, I realize that the first and most important thing is for me to get my thinking straight as a disciple. And I've seen what Jesus says about the poor, about the mourner, about the person who is hungry. And all these things that I've seen help me to realize that I don't think like a disciple. And I want God's help with my thinking. If that would be you, would just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, pray for me. I want help with my thinking. I want God to help me. Just slip your hand up. Okay, just slip right back to anyone else. Yeah. Okay, slip right back to So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray for you. And when I pray, I'd ask that you would pray and commit the same thing to the Lord. And I would ask you as well to make these things a personal study. So much so that so much so that they would become the way that you actually think. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for what you've shown us here today. And I pray that in even the instruction to follow as we conclude our service, Lord, that practically speaking, you would help us to see, God, we need to be disciples. And in order to be disciples, we have to think like disciples. So help us with our thinking. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week I got probably... Oh, I don't know, four or five phone calls from the same guy. And uh, he's not a guy that goes to our church, but he watches our church online. And I don't think he'd mind me sharing this because I'm not sharing who he is, but he represents a lot of people. One of the things he is struggling with was assurance of salvation. His testimony to me was, he said, you know, I grew up in a charismatic church where they taught that you could lose your salvation in the morning and regain it in the evening. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. And it's pretty simple to open the Scripture and show him what the Bible says is required in order for a person not only to be saved, but to know that they're saved. And so I showed him some scriptures and recommended that he memorize some of them. And uh, he called me back probably three or four nights last week, uh, usually in the evenings when it's about bedtime. He starts thinking too much, and he starts thinking, well, what if I'm wrong? What if what the Bible says really isn't true? And so we spent a little bit of time looking at the preservation of the scripture and the inspiration of the scripture and just really the authority just to, is what the Bible says if we know what the Bible says, is what the Bible says true. We ultimately came to the place where we agreed that his struggle had come from a place uh, not of doubting himself, but actually doubting God, whether what God said was actually true. And that really came down to, well, if God says I'm saved, and I think I'm not, when am I calling God? 1 John 5 says we called it, we believe, if we don't believe God, we call Him a liar. Okay, so we came to that place. He called me whenever on men's retreat on Saturday night, I think it was, or maybe, no, Friday night. And he said, you know, I was going to call you last night. He said, but I figured you're, it was too late and you're probably busy. And I know you wouldn't have minded, but I didn't call you. And he said, instead, I just went over the Scripture. And he said, after I read the Scripture a few times, he said, I was okay again. I knew I had salvation. I knew I had eternal life. And I told him, I said, you know, that's all you need to do. Call me for fellowship, but when you need to get settled on something, go to the Scripture. I can show you where it's at in the Scripture, but what's going to settle you is the Scripture. And I want to illustrate it this way. You may have realized today, you know, my way of thinking isn't actually God's way of thinking. I need to be a disciple, but the way a disciple thinks about things, I keep relapsing. I keep thinking like the world thinks. I keep thinking like a person who isn't following Jesus thinks about things. And my counsel to you would be get settled about the authority of the Scripture. Realize if God says it, so it is. And it really doesn't matter even if it makes sense to me. It'll make sense if I get my thinking straight. But it doesn't matter if it does. And then Christian, now you know where to go in the Bible to learn how to think. How not to think like the world thinks about being a follower of Jesus, don't you? And so when you get caught up in the world's thinking a little bit, what should you do? Well, you can call me and say, Pastor, I'm struggling with my thinking. And both of us will open the Scripture and we'll go to this place and we maybe go to some other places. But you know one of the best things is just to go over something again and again and again and memorize it to where all of a sudden you realize one day, 
My thinking's different than it used to be. I think the way God thinks. I think the way the Bible teaches. And I've become biblical, or even without arrogance, to be able to say I've become God-like in my thinking. I see things the way Jesus sees them. Friend, that would be a real help to you. Matthew 5 is one of those chapters of the Scripture that you ought to just have a hold of, have a grasp of. So may I recommend, recommend a few things for you? If you've never memorized Matthew 5, do you think maybe it would be a good place in the Scripture to commit to memory? And maybe come on Sunday night and, and quote it for the Scripture Memory Challenge so Brother Taj gets to memorize it and help him too. So he's probably already memorized it before. But the reality of it is, is that that's a good way. And I hope that's a practical end to our service today. Sometimes I have a come forward invitation. Sometimes uh, we don't. But we don't want to get stuck in a rut. I just want to help you. I want to be a help to you. And I want to say before I dismiss you that we do close our services, but we never do close the invitation. If you need help with something, we're here. And we're available. And we'd like to help you. All right, so let's dismiss. Father, thank you for what you've taught us. And I pray that you'd help us to go out and to think like you think. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.